uh, starting to collect uh, a group of people who have funding to sponsor 16 people to go to B-Sides Tampa. So if you have not bought your ticket yet, you're in luck. We have 16 uh, spots available for uh, us potentially to sponsor you for a free ticket. So, and talk to Sean. So yeah, Sean, and he will get you hooked up with a ticket. So, and uh, and that will be in the slap hashtag UFC channel. Any other announcements? I think that's it. So without further ado, here's Jack. He'll be giving a talk on Docker. All right, hi. I'm Jack. Uh, and is everyone done with the links? Does anyone need to like take a picture real quick before I close it? Okay. Yeah, so I'm going to be doing a talk on Docker. Uh, what we're going to do first is like talk about what it is, how it works, um, and then we're going to go over like how to properly secure it uh, because a lot of people like set up containers in ways that you really should not be setting up containers in the same way that people set up like virtual machines and actual machines in like really, really bad ways that just mess things up a lot. So uh, also I want to like ask before we start, like how many of you are familiar with object-oriented programming? All right, this is perfect. So uh, I'm just going to skip all of like the other analogies I created to try to explain containers because they kind of suck. Uh, so that didn't work, wait. Yeah, there we go. All right. Yeah. So what is Docker? Oh wait, you have a question? Okay. Yeah, so what is Docker? Uh, Docker is a platform for managing Linux containers. Uh, and it's, what it does is it runs as a service in the background on your computer and then you use a uh, command line interface to interact with it and like start, stop, destroy containers, modify containers. And if any of you have ever used like VMware or like ESXi or um, have you, if you've been to like one of our meetings before and you've used the labs, the Kali machines on the browser, it's essentially the same thing as that. It like is a hypervisor for containers, but because like containers and virtual machines aren't exactly the same thing, uh, you can't really call it that. So it's called the, uh, the Docker service and it runs in the background. So the difference, like the fundamental difference between containers and virtual machines is that a container uh, is a lot more like efficient and light than a virtual machine, whereas a virtual machine is a pretty like heavy thing to run on a machine. Uh, if you're not familiar, a virtual machine is essentially where you take one computer and then you run several operating systems concurrently on it. So you can have like a Windows OS running like right next to uh, like Linux OS, or you can have like several uh, Linux ISOs running at the same time, like having different services on them. Uh, but with Docker, you have one machine that has one operating system, and then you can have uh, like separate, uh, in, in the same way that a virtual machine separates like the hard drives of these machines, what Docker does is it separates the root file systems, but they all run on the same uh, like operating system. Instead of having to create an entirely new operating system for each separate like service or machine that you're creating. Uh, and if anyone's familiar with uh, uh, ch root on systems like Debian, this is a good analogy for that. Uh, you essentially have like a separate root directory within your own root directory. Uh, and that's a bad analogy. So yeah, so like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, how many of you are familiar with virtual machines? Like by show of hands. All right, so yeah, Docker is a lightweight virtual machine that doesn't need to emulate hardware or an operating system. So it runs on the same kernel as the host, and it shares the same resources as the host. Uh, but as we can get into later, uh, you can also like restrict how many resources are going into each container in the same way that you can do that with uh, virtual machines. Uh, I'm gonna skip these. These are not. That's not a good analogy. So. A really good way of explaining how Docker works is like with classes and objects. In Docker, there's two like fundamental components, which is the image and the container. The image you can think of as like the class. It has all of the like dependencies and files that you need to like run an app. But then when you use the Docker run command, you take that image and instantiate it with the parameters that you provide it. So 
you have, like, for an example, like, if you had an image that was made for an Apache web server, all it's going to have is the files that you need to make a web server. But then when you use Docker Run, you're saying, okay, I want to use this port for the web server to run on, I want to use this name for the web server, I want it to be on this network, and I want to save its files to this directory. So you instantiate it using Docker Run, and then that makes a container. And that container you can think of as like the object. It's the instantiated class. And it has all of the unique characteristics that go along with like an object, right? So uh, we're going to do an exercise right now. And all of you are going to log into the computers in front of you. Or no, you're going to use the computers that you have, or you can log into the computers in front of you. And we're going to log into the uh, NDG lab to install Docker on our machines. And I didn't put the link up there, but I probably should. Yeah, it's add yeah. It on this huh? Am I adding on this? Yeah, I'll do that right now. If you don't know how to use NDG, I'll come around and help you uh, get set up. ndg.cic.ufl.edu. It's sit with the table number and then password is lol 1234 period. So lol 1234 period and then Once you're on actual thing, I think it's root and then sit. Yeah. I, oh, I th it's in the machine. Yeah, we're in the machine. Okay. Good luck. <laughs> Yeah, you can also run this on your uh, on your computer if you have Linux, or if you have like a. You can't run it on the subsystem unless you have the newer one, I think. But you can run it on a virtual machine on your computer if you want. It just needs to be a Linux host, though. The cool thing with the virtual machine is that there are environments that have to be What's the, uh, what's the password? Uh, Yeah, guys, once you're logged in, uh, you can reserve a pod, uh, and then once you get the pod, you can log into the actual virtual machine, you can get started, like, installing Docker.
How many people currently have a Linux terminal sitting in front of them that they can start typing stuff into? All right, it's, it's better than no one, I guess. <laughs> Hey, does anyone still need this information? Or can I take it down? Oh, I'm taking it down. Wait, one second, then. Let's just take a picture. If you, if you haven't gotten a picture from my login, take a picture of that, and I can... Uh, so this has to be run on Linux because uh, Docker doesn't have support for Windows or Mac, but you can use a Docker client on Windows or Mac. It's just that if you're running any anything like VirtualBox or VMware, they won't work anymore because of how it works. I don't know why it's like that, but it's also better to use Linux to run it because that's what it's made for. All right, so I'm gonna move ahead to the next slide. While people catch up, they can uh, follow along with these commands. The first commands are pretty easy. Uh, it's if you've installed software before on a Linux machine, it's easy. Just app install, uh, Docker IO, and Docker Compose, and then after that, you want to enable the service with the second command. Now, you don't actually have to enable the service for uh, this workshop, but it's just good to do this anyways, because if you restart your computer and you have containers running, if the service isn't enabled, then they won't start. So all of the containers that were running before will just be in limbo until you start the service yourself. You get stuck, raise your hand, I can come to you. That's just not an error because apparently it's not in the Kali repos. Yeah. That's really bad, but that's okay because we're going to move forward on my computer. 
<laughs> and by coincidence, I also happen to have Docker installed already. So that's so cool. Oh, wait, you can download it? Uh, yeah, you can. If, if you want to do that real quick, we can always install it uh, a different way. Wait, you, they can't get ta uh, Docker on it? No, because Kali doesn't have uh, Docker, apparently, in its repos. Well, the presentation was run through, but just not the Kali machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah, we're just gonna move forward on here. I, I'm not. I don't think it's uh, worth the time to like try to install it on the machines. If you can't, if you can, um, you can. If you can figure out how to install it on your machine, then you can do that and follow along. But I'm just gonna type out the uh, the commands up here, and then everyone can look at these. All right. So I'll make that bigger as well. All right, so uh, we're gonna move forward now. I'm sorry about the mishap with uh, with Kali, but this is the first step in our journey into Docker, which is images. When you reference an image in Docker, it uses the following nomenclature. You have a user string in the front, and then it's followed by a slash, which then has the image name, and then a colon, and the final uh, field is the version. So some good examples, some like pretty commonly used ones on the left there are like Ubuntu and Python and Node. These don't have users in the front because they're considered uh, like project images in the same way like on GitHub, if you've ever seen like a, a project account, it's just a project name and then you have like, it's not like an actual user that's associated with all the projects. Um, like all the popular ones have this, so you don't have to type in the user. And on the right, you can see that we have stuff like mine, so like I made a bind image, and it's called decabyte slash bind colon latest. Um, here's another one. This is like a music app that someone made. There's no colon next to it, which just means that the default um, version would be latest. Uh, on the bottom here, here's another image I made, which has a special version on it. The version could be whatever you want. It could be a number, a string, like whatever. It just depends on like what they chose to use. Um, yeah, so that's how images are written now. Now, if you want to pull an image, which is the equivalent of just like downloading it, um, Docker stores this image somewhere specific, uh, somewhere in like far away Docker, and then it has a directory for images. You don't typically like interact with that folder. It will manage all of the uh, like image storage and stuff. So, like, let's just go ahead and pull Ubuntu real quick. So we're gonna do Docker pull Ubuntu 18.04. So it's going to download all the parts that make up the image, and then once it's downloaded, you're good to go. Now the next step, like we talked about what images are, which is like the class, the next step is the container. So if we want to create containers, well, uh, and let's first talk about the features that a container has. A container uh, can have a lot of different features, but the core components of any container is what ports it has what volumes it has and what networks it has. So the port is just like um, a mapping of a port from the container to the host. So say that I wanted to host a web server. If I wanted to have this web server inside of a container, I could say, um, okay, in the container, I want the web server to listen on 8080, but then on the host, I want it to listen on 80. So the host will listen on port 80, and then every time, it gets a request on port 80, it will forward it to the container at 8080, right? If you've ever dealt with like reverse proxies or like port forwarding before, it's that's what this is. And then the next step is volumes. So when you create a container, um, 
So it's obviously there's a root file system and it has certain files in it that relate to your project. But when you destroy that container, it's actually lost forever. You'll never get it back. Um, and that's because containers uh, are considered like stateless entities. When you destroy a container, you shouldn't lose any information that you care about. All the information that you care about should be mounted in something called a volume. So what a volume is, is it's a, uh, it's a unit of storage that Docker keeps track of where you can say, oh, on my, in my container's root system, I want the slash app directory to be stored inside of uh, a volume. So I'm never going to lose slash app when I specify a volume for it. The same with like slash comp. If you had a folder in your container called slash comp and I mounted that as a volume, then it's safe. And when you destroy that container, that folder will be saved somewhere. And then the last thing is networks. Uh, every container has its own IP address and it has its own associated interface depending on like how you've configured it. Uh, and then so this will segregate it from the host so you don't have like the same ports and IP addresses on the container. So this is good because you don't want to like start a container with port 80 and then all of a sudden your host has port 80 open for like no reason. So this is a good example of how it relates to the host. In the middle you have the container and then the host's port at 8080 and 8443 binds to the container at 80 and 443, right? And then the volume similarly, you have slash app inside the container and that binds to a volume that Docker manages called Nginx app. And you can label these volumes however you want them. We're gonna go into how to actually do this with commands right now as well. So these are the basic commands that are involved with creating and running containers. Docker run is how you can create and start a container at the same time. You, there's also commands like docker create, docker start, but those aren't really used very often and I don't really use them very often, so I don't think that they're important to cover. But if you want to create a container, then you can say docker run dash it this means that it will launch with interactivity, means that you can like type stuff into it, and then T means forward like all the output into your terminal. TACTAC RM will remove the container once it's stopped, so you don't leave like containers behind and there's no mess or anything. TACTAC name will give it a name and you can just type whatever that name is in here. And then lots of parameters can follow that, but the last two are always going to be the image and the command. The image is what we talked about earlier, which was like Ubuntu or like Node or Python or whatever your image is. And the command is what is run inside the container when you start it. So I'm gonna go ahead and start up a plain Ubuntu container right now. So Docker run. Oh yeah, like don't be afraid to interrupt me at any point. Yeah. So what's the difference between a Docker image and a virtual machine? And a, okay, so that's a great question. Uh, the question was, what's the difference between a Docker image and a virtual machine like ISO? Uh, an ISO is an entire operating system. It has a kernel bundled in with it, and it also has like all of the dependencies that you need to run a full like Linux or Windows system. But what a container is is it's just the bare minimum that you need for an operating system to run, not the kernel. So there's no kernel included with an image, and also, like when you pull something like an Ubuntu image, like a Ubuntu Docker image, it also has like virtually nothing on it. If you try to run like nano, it doesn't work. I don't even think sudo is included with it. So it's just a very, very stripped down version of Ubuntu, and just like the core file. So I think an uh, Ubuntu image is like 30 megabytes. Total. Like that's how much stuff is inside of it, which is like tiny. If you take like a, a s Ubuntu server image, that's like 800 megabytes. So, yeah. Any other questions about like images? Yeah. So, two, four. So okay. So this command will start Ubuntu in Ubuntu 18.04 container, and it's gonna run bash as soon as I run the container. So now I'm inside of the container. 
Right, so I've gone from my host system to uh, this weird hash that's automatically generated, uh, and that's like the uh, host name of the container according to itself. So if I wanted to see what my UID is, apparently I'm root because my UID is zero. And that's because every time that a container is created, it's created as root. So anything inside the container is being run as root. You can also, we're going to get into later how to like not do that and say it might not be a good idea. Obviously, I'm not root, I'm Decabyte, that's my username, but when I'm in the container, I'm someone completely different. Also, if I real quick just do um, a listing here, you can see this is like any normal like Linux system. This is the root file system has bin, dev, etc, lib. Uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and make a file real quick. I'm gonna call it something easy to see, right? So you can see that files in the root file system. When I leave this container and I list my root file system, it's not in there. And actually, the root file systems are completely different, right? So that shows you how they're like completely segregated and different from each other, and they have completely different uh, like paths. Question. Yeah. How do you get in and out of the container after it's running? That's a good question. We're actually going to get to that right now. So what we did now is starting the container like in the foreground, and then like we left it. So then when we left it, like it's gone forever. Like we're not going to get back to it. So what if you want to run a container in the background and then later on get back into that container? Uh, it's really simple. You just have to run with these flags on the on the beginning of the command here. You put a D, and that means detach from the container. So right now, I just ran it in the background, and if I real quick run a command to see what containers are running, then you'll see that it's ugly, but. Yeah, so you'll see that the, the container is actually running in the background. And it gives you information like when it was created and how long it's been running. If I want to then attach to this container, docker attach. It's that easy. So I'm attached to the container now. And then if I leave the container, right, I use the, up here I use the tac tac rm flag. So that container, once I leave it, is gone. It's no longer with us, right? Can you can you send it to the background, send it to the foreground, and then like yes, that you can you can send it to the background without um, destroying it. Uh, that's a little bit um, more involved because there's like special signals you can send if you want to detach but not like kill processes that are running inside of it. Um, and there's like special parameters you can use as well, but we'll do that later on after we've covered the rest. So this is actually like what we did right now was we ran a container with some like certain command, and then we entered this container, did, stif did stuff in it, and then closed the container. But what if we had a container running in the background and we wanted to just run a command inside of it without necessarily like attaching to it, doing something, and then detaching from it? Uh, this might be useful if you're like scripting and you want to run a command inside of the container real quick. So the way that we do that is with docker exec. Uh, docker exec will run a command inside of whatever container you tell it to. So if we create a container right now like we just did. So I'm going to go ahead and create that same Ubuntu container in the background. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to say docker exec dash it we don't have to run it but it'll i think give you the output of whatever is run inside of there and then we're going to give it the container name which is demo and then we're going to give it a command to do so i think a good command would be touch test file in the root directory all right so this is going to create a file in the root directory and if we run another command inside of this container which is ls root. You'll see that our test file is actually inside the container. And you don't have to, after you type in docker exec it and then the container name, you can type um, like whatever you want in your command after that. All right, so 
Any questions? Does this make sense? Anyone have any questions about like, like something not related to this necessarily, just about like containers? Yeah. It is actually it's very similar. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with uh, virtual environments in Python, but it uses the same principle where like in Python you tell it to, to like change its relative root. So instead of its root being ac the actual computer's root, it uses like this new like directory where it installs like all the dependencies. Docker is the same thing, except instead of installing dependencies, you're, insta you're installing an entire operating system or an entire like Linux system instead of just like some dependencies into like a new root system. Question? Oh. Yeah. Is there a way to move files in and out of one of the containers? Yes. Uh, I don't have it in this presentation, but the command for that is docker cp, docker copy. So you can copy from, con from a container to the host. Um, you can also do stuff like this. You can run cat. So what the cat command will do here is it's going to like just list the contents of the Etsy password. Oh, shadow? Okay. So I'm actually going to cat this out to a file in my host system. Um, so you can see that now I have a file that I can't pronounce, and if I actually list the contents of it, that is the Etsy shadow file of the container, not me. And I just piped that out into a file in the host system. That's one way you can do that. But there's also the copy command, but we're not going to get into that in this one. Yeah, there's a lot of really powerful things you can do with Docker. It can do a ton, but if I went over all of them, we wouldn't have enough time to like get into the like security principles. So here's some useful commands. Uh, for using Docker. Docker PS, I used it earlier, and that like shows running containers. And then you have uh, stop, kill, remove, and stats. Uh, they all do exactly what you think they would do. Stop stops a container. Kill kills a container if it's for some reason won't stop normally. And then RM removes a container. Uh, and then stats gives you a nice little like resource monitor. I think I still have the container running, so I can actually run that. So it, yeah, it just tells you, it gives you a nice little like, resource monitor. Um, it's it's like warped, but yeah, nice resource monitor tells you if you have a bunch of containers running, you can see like all of their states and everything. It's pretty nice. All right, so those are the fundamentals of Docker. If you don't have any questions, like one last time before we move on to uh, to like how to actually securely use Docker. If you have like 50 and containers. And I don't want to use some like dirty scripts. Um, so if you have like a large scale environment with like hundreds or like even thousands of containers, there are platforms to manage stuff like that. So one example, you guys might have heard of it because it's pretty popular. It's called Kubernetes. Uh, it was made by Google and it's really useful for uh, like orchestrating thousands of containers at the same time across like several different systems. Uh, you can also use stuff like Docker Compose, uh, but we're not really going to get like too deep into that because it goes beyond the scope of the presentation. But yeah, Docker Compose and Kubernetes, if you guys are interested. Kubernetes, if you just search up K8S, you can find it online. Yeah, so one thing that we can do with Docker, uh, maybe you have a container that is really resource hungry and you want to limit how much it can use, you can actually uh, like in the same way that you can limit how much a virtual machine uses, you can limit the memory and CPU of a container. If you didn't do this, it would just use the same amount of resources that you have on your host. Mm -hmm. So this might be a good idea if you don't want that, which, which, which is a valid concern for a lot of applications. Uh, something else that's important is um, like making sure that you use the correct images. So Docker files, we didn't go over this, but Essentially, a Docker file is how you build images. It's how images are created in Docker. And so 
you can just think of this as commands that are run inside of a, a container, and then you run all these commands inside a container, and then it's saved as like a template so that you can use it in the future. Uh, a good Docker image like this will install your dependencies and then start your app, and it will use an environment variable like as a password. Like say that you needed a password for your app. It's going to use an environment variable because you really don't want to like write down passwords inside of files. If this is possibly going to go to somewhere like GitHub, you do not want passwords inside of your files. It's really bad. So a really bad Docker file will do stuff like, oh, I'm going to copy all my files into the image which may contain sensitive information and then I'm gonna run the I'm gonna run this like server and put my password in it. Like that's not a good idea. Don't do that. Uh, if you do then you're bad. So yeah. Another thing that we talked about earlier is that like containers run as super user by default and this is not a good thing. So if you wanted to run a container as like a different kind of user, it's really easy. You just have to use the tac tac user flag and then specify the uh, UID and GIDs. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and do this real quick just so you guys can see the difference. So if I start up a container like I did before, so if I I'm going to go ahead and attach to that same container I made before. Uh, and I'm going to print out my uh, user ID. My user ID is zero. This is bad sometimes. So you don't want to be running services as root if you don't have to. And let's go ahead and get around this by using the user command. So I'm making a container, setting the name to demo using the Ubuntu image. And I'm going to say the user is 1,000, 1,000, right? Uh, it's going to, yeah, so that will launch in the background. Let me attach to it again real quick. Uh, it's going to say I have no name because, remember, the root file systems of these containers are different. So I didn't make a 1,000, 1,000 user in the container, so it doesn't have a name. That's OK, though, because we're still running with the user ID 1000 and group ID 1000. So that's not a problem. But if we go ahead and print out this user ID, you'll see that it is 1000 and we're not root. If I try to do something like rm etc, I don't have permission because I'm not root. And that's a good thing. Does anyone have any questions about anything so far? I feel like there is questions. Like, if anyone is scared, like, don't be afraid. Like, I'm not going to go over there and, like, beat you with the microphone. I promise I'm nice. Any questions? Yeah. What have you used Docker before in the past? What if I use it for InfoSec in the past? Yeah. Uh, there was a presentation a while ago where I used Docker. Um, and I used it to host like several separate like proxy servers all on the same machine um, because it made it easier to like manage that kind of thing. You can also, there's not a lot of like specific infosec like applications of Docker, but one, uh, one perspective that infosec can take is like uh, breaking out of Docker containers, right? Like that's almost the equivalent of like breaking out of a virtual machine. Uh, someone, I think next week, is going to be doing a breakout. Is that? Yeah. yeah. If everything goes according to plan, I'll come in for orchestration framework for containers, so a little bit of a, a dive into Kubernetes specifically, and then also Docker container breakout. Yeah, so that, that's a really interesting field is like breaking out of Docker containers. Yeah. You said that Docker isn't like technically a virtual machine because of how it functions. Yeah. Does it allow for nested virtualization then, and that you could use like KVM inside of Docker or use any sort of QEMU uh, inside Docker? For instance? So as far as I'm concerned, I think KVM runs also in the kernel. It uses the kernel as like a backend. So you can use a container to store 
like application files relating to KVM and Limpert, but as far as the computer's concerned, it's going to be running on the same kernel. So you, it, it's not really the same as like nesting virtualization as you do in a virtual machine, because like in a virtual machine, you have like just take a normal machine and then run KVM on it, and then have like virtual machines running on that host. Then you can host um, a KVM inside of one of those virtual machines, right? At that point, you're doing nested virtualization. So when you try to do that in Docker, it's actually just going to be the same as using the host system, running KVM on the host system, right? Because all that Docker is, you can think of it as just the root file system. There's no kernel or anything in there. Yeah. So if you're using Docker on like the MacBook, for instance, then you wouldn't be able to use KVM because that's not available on the host operating system. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And I don't. Is there Docker on MacBook? Yeah, there's Docker. Is it using a Linux virtual machine, or is it running on the Mac kernel? You could use the Linux virtual machine, but I, I don't. Either way. I don't know of there being Docker for the Mac kernel. I could be wrong. You can get it on Windows with a hybrid. I that. Yeah, and yeah, I know that in Windows, when you run Docker, it actually just has a, a Linux virtual machine in the background. I think uh, Mac is the same. It's it uses it does the same. Okay, yeah. So in, in any case, it's going to be using a Linux system in the background. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, we're gonna that one. Uh, another important thing, I think this is the last point, is that when you, uh, when you add a user, so on your host system, when you add a user to the Docker group, uh, by default, when you try to run Docker and you're not part of this group with Docker on it, it's going to tell you that you don't have permission to run these commands. So if I, real quick. So if I go over to this like new user I created, um, and I try to run the Docker command inside of it, it's going to give me, um, it's going to give me some permission denied, and that's because uh, if you're not part of the Docker group, you're not going to have permission to interact with the service. When you do have access to the Docker group, um, you have permission to be root inside of containers that you create. Uh, now, I'm going to go ahead and do a quick demonstration. This should be the last demonstration. Um, and I'm going to show you how you can use, um, how if you have access to the Docker service, you can gain root access on the host system, if you have access to the Docker group on the host system. So my test user, you can see it doesn't have Docker access. But if I add him, to the Docker group. And I try to run Docker again. Oops. Wait, I need to restart the shell. I now have access to the Docker command because I'm part of the Docker group, right? So before I didn't have access, now I do. And if I wanted to gain root access to the system from this new uh, user I called test, then all I have to do is create a container and I'm gonna go ahead and call it, oops. And I'm going to use, I'm going to mount a volume. We talked about volume earlier, and this is, these are directories that are mounted from the host to the container. I'm going to mount root on the host to slash, uh, let's call it uh, host root on the container. This is going to be the Ubuntu image. Now I'm inside of a new container, 
and there's a folder inside the root here called host root. Now if I see what's inside of here, oh my gosh, that's the host root. That's my laptop's root file system. And Wait, prove it, chat, empty chat. Yeah, yeah, real quick. Uh, if I show you my UID right now, it's zero, and I'm currently inside of my laptop's root file system. That's bad. That's really bad. So Docker group, the Docker group on your system, treat it like the same as the root group. It's basically the same. You have a question? Yeah, so you, you couldn't add, so when you were inside a Docker container, right? Mm -hmm. And you added uh, that user, that user inside the Docker container to your Docker group in your host, right? No, I was, I, I, made, a, I made a user on the host called test. And then I added that user to the Docker group. And then from that user, I created a container that mounted the host file system into the container. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Did you, were you able to, the user that you have, uh, what's the user that you have in your local computer? That's not Rito. Oh, uh, Decabyte. That's, Decabyte. Okay. yeah, that's my. Does user. that one have root permission? He, he has sudo, he's part of the sudo group, so he has root permissions. Uh, but if you ran sudo and tried to run a command, you would need to enter a password, which is a part of a protection. But if you're part of the Docker group, you don't have to run sudo to use the Docker command. So it's the equivalent of having like just straight root access to the machine, right? Yeah, so that was a lot, I think. Uh, but it's a very, very interesting field. Uh, containers have been around for about like 10 years and they've only been getting more and more and more popular. Um, so I wanna make sure that if anyone has questions, now would be like a perfect time for me to answer them. If you have questions unrelated to containers about anything I did, I'll also love to hear them so I can possibly answer them. So, Last chance. Question? Yeah. So is there any use for Docker other than just a more convenient um, config script without entangling dependencies for different applications? Is there a broader application of Docker other than that? Yeah. Um, yes. For sizing, right? Yeah, like if you wanted to scale up an application using virtual machines versus using Docker, the difference is like planetary, it's insane. The number of resources you save having distributed containers versus distributed virtual, like virtual machines. So like if you think about like installing Ubuntu onto a virtual machine, it takes up like, like what, like a typical virtual machine can use like 10 gigs, at like the least, you usually wanna leave about like five or 10 gigs of space on it. Um, and you also, have to give like an ISO for each of those and then maybe if you're making an app, you have to create like a custom template. Um, so if you use like a virtual machine, scale that up to thousands of different instances and you're easily gonna hit like the terabytes in terms of how much disk size you're using just for boilerplate, just for dependencies and like binaries for the app to run. But when you use Docker and you download an Ubuntu like 30 megabyte image, that's like tiny, tiny. You can get an Ubuntu container running and like, you saw how long it took to start, it took like two seconds. That was a brand new untouched Docker container with, with Ubuntu in it. The same amount of time to set up like an Ubuntu virtual machine would be like, or the same, the same system like set up in a virtual machine would be a lot longer, like at least like 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and another really good use that I've been using is for development. Like when you're developing something or you're like trying to compile an app, like I've had a lot of cases where like I see a really cool app like on GitHub and I wanna like build it and then it's like, oh yeah, you can build it, don't worry, you just have to install 50 dependencies and add a repo to your, like, to your like repositories. And that's really not like a good solution in my opinion. So a way that you can get around that is you can start up a container, install the dependencies, build the app and then destroy the container and you never had to install dependencies on your machine. You can mount a directory from the host to the container where the built like program is stored. 
and then destroy the container and no dependency mess, nothing. You can also use it when you're like making your apps. Docker helps a lot. Like if you wanted to make a Node app, you don't have to worry about like making sure the right version of Node is installed on your computer, making sure like all the packages are like up to date. You can just have a Docker image that has all of that for you immediately. <coughs> yeah. So any other questions? It's also really good to like mess around. Like just go on a container, like do like crazy stuff you can never do on like a virtual machine because you're like, oh my god, I don't want to wait like half an hour to like make another one. Go into a container, wreak havoc, destroy it, make a new one in two seconds. Like, it's nice. What's the difference between Podman and Docker? Portman and Docker? Oh, Podman. Uh, Podman is this, it's basically the same. So Docker has a service that runs in the background and then you use the Docker command to interact with that service. Podman just uses uh, forking processes to create containers. So instead of having a service that manages all the containers, Podman creates the container and then just forks it off. So except for having one secure daemon, no, except for that one difference, there's nothing else? Uh, the other difference is that Podman is created by Red Hat and Docker is created by the Docker Foundation. They both use the same like uh, standards, which is called the Open Container Initiative. Uh, so you type in Docker PS or Docker Run or Docker Create, all of these are exactly the same with Podman. It's just Podman create, Podman run, Podman, they're exactly the same, yeah. It's just different takes on the same implementation. Uh, but Docker has been around for a little bit longer, um, so chances are you will find more support on Docker, but it should apply to Podman because they're the same thing, basically. Yeah. You have to be a you have, to be, you have to have pseudo privileges to add someone to the Docker group? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you, yeah, you can't just, uh, if you have permissions to add groups, then you wouldn't need pseudo, but I don't, yeah, you need to be pseudo typically to add them to a group. All right, so yeah, he actually brought this up early, the, an alternative for people to look into if they're interested in Podman, uh, and it's a version of Docker that runs without a service in the background. It's just a, a it's a CLI tool that you can use to do the exact same things that we just did today, but instead of typing Docker and then the command, you type Podman and then the command. So it's really interesting if anyone wants to check it out. All right, yeah, so that's it. If you want to look at rock out all this stuff. <laughs> it's at docs.docker.com. There's tons of really, really, like, super useful stuff there. I'm also going to start working on a tutorial series for Docker and like containers. So I'm just going to plug my blog in right here if you guys want to go to it. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys for coming. Don't forget, we have B-Sides Tampa coming up. Join the 6th.